I earned the PhD somehow, but I was born with ADD. That's where the special projects uh, comes from. <laughs> it was the best job title for me at Woods Hole. Uh, it's a privilege, and uh, it's an honor for me to be here uh, today. Um, there we go. You know, I never found New Yorker cartoons to be all that funny. <laughs> this, one, this one says, I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. And uh, there's a, I think there's a reason for that. It's because most of us don't know or don't think much about the bottom of the ocean. And, and I love this. Uh, this is the McCann Erickson. It's an advertising company's logo, truth well told. In science, we aspire to get to the truth. And the well told part is something we need to do a little bit differently. and something that AAAS has been very, very active in and uh, so important. Uh, when you think about it as a species, you know, we get this thing should have knocked our socks, should have knocked our socks off, this view of the Earth from, the, from uh, Apollo astronauts coming back from the moon. And it wasn't very long before we started taking it for granted. You know, we take the planet for granted. There is everything we need to, that's all of our history. Everything, everyone that lived uh, before us and will live beyond us for the most part have lived on this planet. Yet, you know, after a while, we just got used to it. And uh, we also got used to this, the fact that, you know, we heard Nancy mentioned it earlier, that 71% of this planet's covered with water. Average depth's about two miles. Okay, maybe two and a half, two to two and a half, somewhere inside there. That's the view of the Pacific on this planet. You hardly ever see that view because usually when people show you the Earth, they want to show you something besides blue. But there's an awful lot going on in that blue. And back to the lovely ladies having coffee. If, if they just thought about what happened in the past couple, couple years, um, you had the Japanese tsunami, and which was tragic and uh, you know had to do a lot with the floor of the ocean. That's the earthquake clusters in the trench to the east of Japan. And, no, we couldn't have stopped that probably or predicted that exactly, but knowing more about the floor of the ocean, especially in the trenches, would have helped us prepare for what might come, come next. Another thing that happened recently that grabbed headlines, of course, was Deepwater Horizon, the Gulf oil disaster. And um, here you know, on the top, I show the, the, uh, a picture, a mosaic of some of the ships out there and some of the structures in the Gulf. On the bottom, I've got the mythical creature, the Kraken, pulling down a ship from, a, from an old painting. And uh, I did that because to me it seemed like we had a monster loose on the floor of the Gulf of Mexico for so many months. You know, every time we turned on the television, there was this thing spewing oil out into the environment. And uh, yeah, sure, oil companies are good at getting oil out from deep inside the earth, but once that oil gets into the environment, especially that depth where we don't know what's going on, uh, that's trouble. And in this particular case, you know, it bugged me that we had this leaky pipe in our own backyard that we couldn't plug, and yet at the same time we were driving robots around the surface of Mars. There's something unbalanced about that. I'm not saying that space exploration should stop, but you know, this, is, this was kind of ridiculous that we couldn't stop this leak or understand it. It was months before we knew what was coming out of the seafloor, how much came out, and where it went. Still don't know exactly. And then to make matters worse, we gave the monster venom by using dispersants uh, in, in this case. So you know, that has to do with the floor of the ocean too. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, this plane, you know, we're always told planes don't fall out of the sky. Well, this one did. This is Air France Flight 447, and with 20, 228 lives on board on the way from Rio to Paris, back in June of 2009, it fell out of the sky, just disappeared off the radar screens. And it landed right on top of an underwater mountain range, a place where we haven't <coughs> explored almost at all. You know, we keep saying we've explored about 10%, 5%, 7% of the deep sea. In this area, almost nothing. So uh, there were a few clues, and they came much later after the crash. Uh, we had uh, pieces of the plane, this tail section that you see there, a piece of the galley floating around, and all told, a uh, number of bits of the plane and, and bodies on the seafloor that were recovered, but up to two weeks after the crash. And you know, to understand there were no witnesses why that plane went down, we had to find the black boxes, two of them, the cockpit voice recorder and the cockpit data recorder. And the French had looked valiantly. Many, many people had been out there looking and uh, just didn't have the right equipment and didn't have the time to think about it. And, and we got involved. And it wasn't an easy task. There was a search circle. That's the circle. And, the, and what you see there is a map of the mountainous terrain. Uh, basically, what we were doing is looking for something the size of a shoebox, two of them, in, in mountainous terrain the size of the Alps, only uh, the, uh, rugged as the Alps of the Rocky Mountains, but at nighttime. So it was a daunting task. <laughs> not easy, not easy, but you know what? Uh, and that goes to what I have to say. Everything from here on in, it's all about three things. It's all about technology, uh, having the right technology. It's all about having the talent, teams of people with the right talent. 
and, and to have the, techno, to have the technological expertise, how to take that talent, operational, operational expertise, out to see and, and do a program. You've got to have those three things to be successful in the, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the deep sea. And we were fortunate enough to have, to be able to mount all those. Why? Because we had spent decades studying those mountain range. And, I, and I, we always thought that if we couldn't find that, who could? You know, that, that was our world to explore that, that uh, mountain range. And luckily we gained the confidence of our French colleagues and the families and victims of the victims of the, uh, of the flight. And it wasn't very long and we actually found the remains of the aircraft. That's what it looks like in, in sonar, and that, you know, that looks like nothing, but to the experienced operators on board that boat, that, was, that could have been the plane. We were using very sophisticated autonomous vehicles called Remus vehicles. We had three of them on board that boat. There was no ship on the planet that had that much underwater firepower on it at that time. So we reprogrammed one of the vehicles to go take pictures, and these are the images that came back in the, from the mountain range, and so we knew we had found the plane, and it wasn't much longer after that that we found those, uh, black, those uh, black boxes, and a, another team, Phoenix International, went, uh, identified them and recovered them, and they were able to solve that mystery, uh, which was a great achievement for, uh, for us. Um, there's another uh, shipwreck. Well, actually, if you turn on the TV today, there's a shipwreck in Italy that's got, gotten a lot of attention. Um, and very sad because there were lives lost, and it's a very tragic thing. But this one, you're going to hear an awful lot about because in uh, April 14th of this year, it's 100 years since Titanic struck an iceberg in the Atlantic. And I, I want to show this because, again, you know, that's Titanic leaving its docks. It, it was uh, 70 some odd years. There were a lot of people looking for a Titanic. Uh, it was 70 some odd years before that ship was found by Bob Ballard and his team. Uh, this is one of the first images of Titanic. It's one of the boilers. That's 15 feet across, so that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, big. And uh, I co-led an expedition to Titanic in 2010. A lot of people said, why are you going to go back to Titanic? You know, we learned an awful lot from Titanic. We weren't going to make documentaries, for sure. We weren't going to recover artifacts. We were going to learn about those three things again. about new technologies about talent and about operational techniques. And uh, I can't show you the, the brand new imagery. We're still processing a lot of that. It's going to be relief, released fairly soon. But the whole idea, idea was to really take this Titanic site and treat it like scientifically, an archaeologic site for the first time. Not about adventure diving, not about um, recovering artifacts, but how do you take a site like Titanic, this icon, and actually understand it? You know, every single year, about 14 ships, if you look at the average, about 14 ships this size go to the bottom of the ocean. Typically, we commit the ship and the souls for eternity to the deep, never to be seen again. Well, sometimes that's not satisfying, and we want to know why that ship sank. The families want to know, the shipbuilders want to know, insurance companies want to know. So we have to be able to treat these places now in a more forensic, forensic, forensic way. And uh, this image, this is a painting by Ken Marshall, and it's an image that I lived with. I've been at Woods Hole since 1987, right just after Titanic was discovered. And I lived with this image above my desk, and it made me crazy because it's a painting. You know, it's very dramatic. It got everyone's uh, attention. It's emotional. There's the whole Titanic. There's the submarine Elvin. But it is a painting, and we've been striving to have the right kinds of technologies, the right platforms, robots, submarines, and the right sensors, cameras, sonars, to be able to make that real. And I think we've just about gotten there. So virtual Titanic uh, is, is something that you'll be seeing in the very near future. And, and that's just a stepping stone to other virtual places beneath the sea. All about technology. And, and these are just some of the vehicles that have been developed at Woods Hole. And there's many more across the country and around the world. But it is becoming an age of robots out there an age of, uh, of robots to explore and understand, uh, understand the deep ocean. Many of these can be traced directly back to the first robots and cameras were used, uh, their ancestry on Titanic. Um, you know, so, so those are a couple things that we knew were at the bottom of the ocean. It was a matter of finding them. Titanic, Air France 447, Deepwater Horizon, they're practical things. It's this thing that really gets to me, is the unknown ocean, what's out there beneath the sea. And here, this is a map by Bruce Hazen and Marie Tharp. They were at Lamont Doherty, part of Columbia University now. And it's an amazing thing to me. And it shows this underwater mountain range that wraps around the world like the seams of a baseball. That's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge, 50,000 miles long. And you know, so we have the longest, greatest mountain range on Earth. There's thousands of peaks higher than the peaks in the Alps. There's thousands of valleys, many times wider, deeper, and longer than the Grand Canyon. Um, there's underwater rivers, there's underwater lakes, there's underwater waterfalls. 
Uh, there's life where we never expected life at all. And let me just give you an example, because almost every time we go into the ocean with a new piece of technology, we're, we almost every time we're surprised. Sometimes we're startled, and in some cases we see something that's totally revolutionary. Uh, these images are from uh, some of the work Bob Ballard and his group did in NOAA. Uh, what you see there is a, basically a pool of water sitting uh, in, in the foreground with some white sandy uh, rocks, corally rocks around it. Corally is a word. I just made that up. <laughs> um, there's the water. You can see ripples in it. We'll get even closer still. You see the ripples a little bit better. The exciting, startling, surprising thing is that that water that you're looking at is at the floor of the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, So from where you're sitting inside a submarine, you're looking out the window of the sub at a body of water at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, and This is a fairly small pool. They can be larger lakes. They can be big lakes. They can be a mile by 10 miles, several hundred feet deep. So, and we also see places where there's water that flows across the bottom. They're just like currents at the surface, except they happen to be denser. The water you saw there was many times denser than the seawater, so it's all density driven. But there's a, a current that flows across the floor of the ocean like that. You know, understanding those things, it's something when you dive, when it's pure exploration in the darkness of the deep sea, you, you never know what to expect. Um, again, back, back to the map, I want to look at that mountain range quickly, or the floor of the, of the ocean. Technology is important, and if you're going to the deep sea, quite often you need a fairly big ship. It's not a one-person deal. I mean, you need a team of people. This is a typical Elvin launch. Elvin's a mini submarine that we operate at Woods Hole for the National Deep Submergence uh, Facility. Uh, three people inside the submarine, uh, typically wondering, should I have gone to the bathroom one more time on board the surface <laughs> ship? It's a long day inside the sub. Uh, and over the side you go, and every one of you that have been in the ocean and in the submarine on the way to the deep knows that when you hit this point in that dive, everything starts to change. It's not just about what happens in your brain, it's about what happens inside your spirit. That you get that lovely color blue that penetrates and that you're starting to leave the sounds and the motions of the surface behind and you hear the, the sounds and the feeling of surrounding of the deep sea in front of you. The divers check out the front of the, of the sub to make sure everything's properly sealed and fixed and down you go and it's about a two and a half hour commute to the bottom. And, uh, and it's an amazing experience. And you know what? You'll never replace the submarine, that experience, getting in the ocean with a robot. I mean, they go hand in hand, and, and I'd like to see the robot that's gonna convince Sylvia Earle not to get in the water. It's just not, <laughs> it's never gonna happen. You're never gonna replace that. So, uh, but there's something about actually being there, no matter how deep you're talking about, that's pretty impressive. Uh, the mid-ocean ridge and the, the floor of the ocean in general is volcanic, and I just want to share with you some of the latest video. Um, we've been working a, lot, a long time on getting uh, high-quality video images from the deep sea, and Bill Lang and his team at Woods Hole have put together a great video package, uh, and we've taken it all over the world, and now we've got a number of these cameras that we want to get out there so we can record scenes like that at the bottom of the ocean. The vents themselves, uh, you know, they dropped out of uh, the media for a while. This is a, a place on the, uh, in the East Pacific, southwest of Acapulco, and it's about uh, two miles deep. The water temperature is about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a place where we thought there should be no life at all, and instead, we found life that rivals the tropical rainforest in terms of density and diversity. And that wasn't predicted, it was just stumbled across, stumbled on by geologists. So in one moment of, of exploration, we revolution, revolutionized the way we think about life on Earth. Um, let's see, okay. So, you know, a whole ocean that has yet to be explored on, on this ocean planet with seven billion-ish going up to nine billion-ish people. And you know, everything we do, no matter where you live, has an impact on the sea, and conversely, wherever you live, the ocean has an impact on you, and yet we have this relationship with a body that we don't even know. We haven't even explored it. We've explored only a few percent of it. I don't know if you're gonna see this, you can't. Uh, that's okay, I'll tell you what it is. It's the Earth at night, and it's the lights of the Earth at night, different kinds of lights showing where you are in this in the development, what kind of energy you use, and most of North America and Europe, electric energy, okay? Uh, most of Africa, on the other hand, is uh, village fires. That's all those little gold dots you see there. That's the African continent. Those are village fires. Not a lot of uh, electrical lighting in terms of percentage going on there. What amazes me is on a planet we call Ocean Planet that there are people living here that are clinging to the edge of life because of one thing that mostly that they don't have, which is water, sanitary water. How can that be on the Ocean Planet? So we wanted to take a look at this and we took all the water off the Earth to find out how much there really is. That's the Earth on the left. 
all the water on the Earth is that ball on the right by volume. If the Earth is the size of a basketball, take all the water off of it, it fits into a ping pong ball. How can that be? Think about the Atlantic Ocean. I said two miles average, that would be a couple inches, but two, two miles average thickness by, by 5,000 miles across. That's, that's a very thin layer of, of water that exists out there. Fresh water is even less. It's that little pinpoint to the right of the blue ball. That's all the fresh water. And so for us to live, you've got to take that little bit of fresh water, sprinkle it in just the right spots at just the right amounts in just the right time of year, or we collapse as a society. Okay, and a lot of the key to this the keys to the future, clues to our past, come out of the ocean, and especially the deep ocean. We don't know a lot about storage, transport, and heat of heat uh, from, from the deep ocean, about what the currents are do doing down there in the deep ocean. So we need to get out and explore so we can understand. A great philosopher once said, you can observe a lot just by watching. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was a good old Yogi Berra. And the truth is, that's the truth, and we need more observation from the deep, from the deep sea. And uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, it's another quote by Marcel Proust. Uh, he said, the true voyage of exploration is not so much in seeking new landscapes, which we do, uh, but in having new eyes. And to me, it means using these new tools, new platforms, new sensors, uh, going out and exploring the ocean, but for the first time, thinking about this planet differently. Thank you very much. Thank you.